Bible has a little bit to say about work, I think. I, I think that we need to understand that there are scriptures and scriptures and scriptures. By the way, if you're not happy with the job you're at, maybe we ought to think about changing careers. By the way, today, the average 22-year-old will have four different careers in their life. If you go on Google, they have just announced that they've had over 30 million choices, career changes. We live in a world where people are just bouncing around. I want us to live in a world of stability, knowing that God has a plan for our lives. So whatever your job is, the first thing we need to do, we need to understand we view it as a blessing. It's a blessing. It's a blessing from God. Now, it occurred to me that some people may have the wrong idea about work based on the story of Adam and Eve. They're under the impression that man was never intended to work and was only saddled with this responsibility after sin came into the world. We only have to work, we have to sweat, we have to work, we have to toil because you ate an apple. Excusing, excusing, excusing. Well, Adam, you were standing right there, so... There's no excuse on your part. From the very beginning, God teaches us that Adam was charged with work. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God rested on the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from the work of creating that he had done. This is the count of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made earth and heaven... And, there was, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and there was no plant in the field had yet sprung up. For the God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. The Lord took the man out, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and care for it. Here's the surprise, folks. We are designed to work, all of us. We're all designed to work. This concept of, oh, I want to win the lottery and slide. There, there's a program on TV, Million Dollar Lottery Winners or something. And, uh, you know, we're over 40% of lottery winners within five, five years are broke again. Within five years, they're broke again. God did not teach us. He did not create us to be idle. He created us to be a people to go to work. Now the Lord had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what you'd name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. How did Adam ever come up with platypus? I mean, that's just, just giraffe I can see. But the platypus is the leftover parts. I mean... Forget it, I won't even go there with the platypus. He brought them to the man to see, and, he, and that he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and the fields of the feed. From day one, God gave Adam responsibilities to complete or work in the Garden of Eden. Before that, God showed us as himself. He works heaven and earth, planets, systems. Now, that when, what happened is Adam and Eve sinned. By the way, Adam sinned. Eve was deceived. And they found themselves banished from the Garden of Eden. Because, verse 7, You've listened to your wife. You ate from the tree which I commanded you, which I commanded you not to. You must not eat of it. Curses the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are dust, and dust you will return. Interesting that... So many believe, well, the reason work such lousy is we didn't have to really work. They had to work before the Garden of Eden. We just got thistles now and all kinds of ugly stuff. How many have ever been walking in a yard 
and found a thistle. I mean, you didn't see it, you found it. I, we need to catch this. God did not curse Adam and Eve. He didn't curse work. He cursed the ground. Or in other words, God made the ground more resistant to Adam's work. Now, he could still get results from tilling of the ground, but only after hard work and hard labor. Now, there's thistles and thorns which there were, weren't never of. Sweat would be required for the bread to be provided, and dirt that was cursed would claim their lives someday. Here's an interesting thing. One of the things I see, and Patty has introduced me to all these home um, reconstruction shows. I don't know what they're called. It. There's a whole channel of them. People taking old homes and redoing them or doing this. And, and it always takes work. It always takes sweat. And you're always getting dusty and dirty. There was a guy I walked by yesterday when you were watching one. He looked like he just had a mask on his face and over his mouth. And just everything else is dirt, dirt, dirt. We need to understand that work is not a curse. It's a gift. We need to understand that we need to, if you want to improve your look, outlook at work, improve your attitude. You want to see your current position to change, change your attitude about your current position. Work is not a burden, it's a blessing. Amen? Let, let, let's, it just, people drive me crying. I'm only getting, I, here I am flipping burgers, and I'm only getting 20 bucks an hour. If you're in California and you're working at, uh, at in and out that's what you're getting paid. You know, and I understand flipping burgers is a hot, sweaty job. I mean, we stopped at uh, in and out and my goodness, there is a business that God has blessed. You ever, how many people have never been to in and out Whoa, we'll pray for you. Four of us. Um, started by a Christian. Uh, started by a charismatic Christian. You know what he, he also started? First drive through. First drive through. He, he didn't have really property, didn't have enough to build a restaurant. And he was always working with ham radios and tinkering with this and tinkering with that. And so what he did was, well, we got a window here. We can cook them here. So he set up a little walkie-talkie little tight thing out front. And you went and pushed on it and told him what you want. And then you drove up to the window. So he invented that. By the way, every cup you get it in and out. Every plastic cup. Every... Um, box of fries they have a scripture verse on them and he will not change and he's passed away but his other people have it he understood that it was a good thing God gave him a blessing to have a work the greatest stimulant tranquilizer narcotic and to some extent antibiotic in short the greatest thing to genuine panacea is to have is medical, known to medical science, is work. MD. Ronald Reagan had a famous saying, the man who does, the man who does what he does will never, loves what he does, will never work a day in his life. Amen? We need to understand, God's given us an ability, he's given us an urge, he's given us a need to work. Now, if you can't work, that's another thing. But if you can work and you're waiting around Buying lotto tickets for the right thing to happen, it's not going to work. I told you many, many years ago, I borrowed somebody's truck to move some stuff, and the guy was always complaining about didn't have enough money, just didn't have enough money. And one of the things I do, by the way, if I ever move again, I'll probably just burn down my house, call insurance, burn down the move. You've moved me two or three times, know that. Anyway, um... Uh, when I ever borrow a truck, I'll put gas in it, I'll washed and cleaned up, and that's the way you're supposed to return it. And so when I was doing it, he had one of those bench seats, and I flipped the bench seat forward, and there were hundreds, probably not hundreds, thousands of dollars of scratched-off tickets. 
he would buy these, t- these things. I don't know how, what they come in, but obviously. And he would just scratch, 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 scratch. Throw them back there, scratch, scratch, scratch. And he just kept sorting them back there. And I'm thinking, <laughs> bro, I know why you're broke. I know why you're broke. You're not working, and you're buying scratch-offs with what money you should be using. But it was interesting. I, I won't pick on that poor guy. He did a lot of things. So we first need to understand that God has given us work as a blessing. He's also given us work as a bridge. The right job of the bridge for you to accomplish many wonderful things. It's a, build, it's a bridge for building a, a good reputation with other people. How many of you have ever worked outside of the church? How many of you have ever had a, a career with other people? Yeah. I, I, I think we all have. Come on, I think unless you're uh, born into famously wealthy family. I am. My God owns everything. Your job is a, is a bridge. It's a blessing, it's a bridge. And whatever you find, your hand, whatever your hand finds to do, do all to the glory of God. You start it by a good reputation. Someone once wisely said, every job is a self-portrait of the person who does it. Autograph your job with excellence. Amen? It's important. And I know a lot of you are retired, I'm not talking, but I'm talking about anything we do in the world. We need to do with excellence. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Do all things without grumbling, complaining, disputing. We need to look at our job as a blessing and a bridge. There's so much we can do. I, most of you know I've worked, I worked some really nutso jobs in my life. I've cleaned out, the, what, what are some of my worst? Here, my, my, I don't know. I cleaned out the holds of fishing boats after the ice and the fish were taken out, and all that was left was slime, guts of fish that got squished, and scales. Paid well, got there at four in the morning. But I mean, that was a stinky, stinky job. Almost as bad as that was selling ladies' shoes. I, I, uh, <laughs> oh, man. You ever seen a lady try to get into a shoe that's five sizes too fo- small for her? No, it's what I wear. Not in this lifetime, sweetheart. <laughs> it just, your job can be a bridge. It's got to be a, not only are you going to build a good reputation, you're going to work with people who you probably, they don't even know you're a Christian until you do your job right. Most of you know that one of the jobs I did for many years while I was pastoring was a rural route driver, <coughs> rural route mail carrier, excuse me. And it was important. And I talked to people, aren't you the pastor from New Life Foursquare Church? Up, the new one up on D1? Yes, I am. What are you working for? Meet people, get to know people. I didn't tell them we did it so we could pay the church off early, but I got to meet so many nice people. I got to pray for so many people. Got to, so many opportunities to be with people who would never get in a car and drive to a church. They'd never switch on a TV to see a televangelist. They'd, nothing. That never happened. I got to meet people where they were at right then and right there. What a joy it was. Some had never been to church in their life. We did things together. I always carried a little shovel in my Jeep and if the mailbox was a little that, I'd try to find a few rocks that I'd dig down and refirm the mailbox. There was a few months in a row that I carried a, a thing of sand and some concrete. Just doing things for people. The job is a bridge to meet new people. A job is a bridge to minister to the needs of others. Your job is an opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity to reaching out and need, meeting other people's needs. And this is what became of that job. The job went from 80 cli- customers to 119 when I finished. Because all I would do is just talk to them. By the way, that works, the way that works is you're talking to people, delivered a package or something. Hey, you don't have a mailbox. Why are you paying this much money to have this little box in town? 
that you normally get your packages and stuff between 8 and 5. If, if, and I've helped put up more of those big mailboxes. By the way, if you live in the country and you've got a little tiny mailbox, replace it with a big mailbox. It just, it was so nice to be able to, and I'd sometimes go my day off and take a little cement, take a little stuff, and just go talk to them. Don't have to preach to them, just got to talk to them. Just got to let them know what's going on. Therefore, as we have opportunities, let us do good to all people. Each of you should not look after your own interests, but also the interests of others. I believe that if, We'll pay attention and we'll look at our job as a blessing from God and a bridge to be able to talk to people about God. We're going to see that God's put us there with opportunity with specific people in mind. The route job, I can think of three or four different people who were the years I was there, God would allow me to just minister and minister and minister. They had never gone anyplace else. But that little pastor from the four square church they they'd let him talk to him you get trusted if you do your job right you get trusted if you like your job i had the keys of million dollar homes multi-million dollar homes right on the ocean would you we're, we're snowbirds we're going to be gone for october november december january february march would you just check in on our home here's the keys and that's what i did Oftentimes, I would have my lunch on their screened-in, walled-in balcony, looking over the ocean, thinking, pretty nice house here. You never get this on my salary. <laughs> but you really get to minister to all types of people. And we need to understand that God's got us there because he wants us to talk to them. It's a bridge. Your job is a bridge. Where you live in your neighborhood is a bridge. It's a blessing. Oh, you don't know my neighbors. You ever thought that's what your neighbors are saying about you? And it's in a bridge for introducing the reality for people. There's, there's again, people who will never open up. They'll never talk about it. Two of the people, in, anybody here has ever worked a uh, rural route job? Or, John, I guess you'd do it in yours. How much your mail? Oh, he's asleep. Um, it's okay, he's asleep. Let him sleep. All you can do is just Christian reach over and push him over. He'll win. <laughs> One of the things you do is everybody's got your own slide. You've got your little cubicle and you got up here and it's like tons of these little boxes. And it's on all three sides. It has all your addresses. And I'll never, ever forget the first time I, I uh, went to work there. And this, her, her, her name was Penny. And she'd go, doom, 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 doom. she's sorting this stuff and putting it in their bottom. Whoa, 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 whoa. Man, she was so fast. I think she's a genius. She's one. And after a couple of weeks, it's all natural. But you sit there and you do it, and then people talk back and forth. I usually, those were the days of headphones and uh, tapes on the side. And, and there was a couple in the in, in further down who were just. I won't. What's a nice word? They just weren't nice. They would always find some guy on TV or something else to bring, hey, Nash, you like that? And I'm, oh, leave me alone. And most of them, I'll, I'll say out of the ten, that they were really nice. These two just, I don't know what it was. They obviously got hurt someplace along the line. Church hurt them. People hurt them. I understand that. Didn't respond at the time. One of them had a kid who rebelled. He was, the man was a, a a decent person, I guess. But his kid decided, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach my dad a lesson. You're either going to let me do this or go to that, whatever it was. And so he doused himself with fire with gas. And he told his dad, hey, either you let me or I'm going to light myself on fire. So he strikes the match. He has no idea. Foof! Because you're close. You don't have to... You know, and they rushed him to Seattle. Get a call at home. I get a call at home. My kids be admitted. I know you pray. Would you pray for my son? They can be rude, crude, and obnoxious year after year. 
But the minute it comes to their kids, the minute it comes to their home, guess who they're calling? They're calling you. Because on the job, you didn't take the bait. On the job, you didn't respond negatively. At your neighbor, when his dog deposits in your yard, you didn't pick it with a shovel and throw it back. Ed, I know. <laughs> the reality was the kid lived. Another time, a person's kid got in a car wreck. And uh, that was the... It's interesting. Both people who were, I don't know, just looking for a chance to jab you. You know those kind of people because you're a Christian? And so both of them had... Ser- and both... One called me at home. The other met me at work. I need you to... I know you pray, but would you pray for my kid? They were in an accident. It's amazing if we'll just do our job. Do it with excellence. Do it with kindness. Don't grumble. Don't fight. And don't fight back. You don't have to. We serve a risen king. He doesn't need me to defend him. He's a lion of the tribe of Judah. Open the cage and let him do his work. Live your life in such a way that they're going to see it. View your job as a bridge. View your neighborhood as a bridge. It's a blessing. It's a bridge for introducing the reality of Jesus Christ. He wants us to build relationships with these people. He doesn't want us to go to the back room, into the break room, and and hang up flyers, hang up my business cards. Repent, you heathen, mud duck, low life, jellyfish, palm scum. Or you're all going to hell. Oh, no, I never put that. <laughs> Some people are like, where do you get that? Just not, don't know. The New Testament models that we must discover that we love unbelievers. Amen? We just need to do it. And, and you've got to learn how to, how to start conversation. Just let you think. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer everybody. There's the thing. We need to understand. We do not need to be critical of everybody and everything all the time. All too many believers live in a a life of barking and whining and complaining. We need to be people of life and hope in Jesus Christ. The world's going to do what the world's going to do. We need to portray life that we have a hope in Jesus Christ. Attitude is everything in this. But in your heart, set Christ apart as Lord. Always be prepared to give the answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness, respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior and in Christ will be ashamed. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick story. In the in the Church of God, in, in the no, not Church of God. It's uh, oh, come on, Church of Christ. If you get saved in the Church of Christ this morning, they will baptize you after service. Now I give you an opportunity every week to come to Christ, come to get prayer. But I want to teach you what it means. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just a tradition they have in the Church of Christ. Well, a friend of ours pastored the Church of Christ, a good friend, for years and years and years. And he told me about a young man, Albert. Very short in stature, un, unassuming, unpretentious. You'd, you'd forget Albert five minutes after you met him. Do you understand the kind of person I'm talking about? But he got saved. He got baptized. He started going to church. Really nice guy. He did his job. He, he uh, had been saved a couple of years, and the, our friend said, hey, i got a job for you to do. And, and Albert was just a great guy, and he says, okay. He says, I want you every Sunday morning to come to church, prepare the baptismal, and light the baptismal, because it was gaslit. You had to light the baptismal before it's warm, because after church, if anybody gets saved, a lot of people aren't going to want to walk into an ice cold tank. It's going to be a lot nicer. And so every week, after week, after week, Albert came. He lit the, the baptismal, got it warm, got it everything. What? Well, his other job had been uh, deliveries, 
And then he began to sell life in church. Albert's not the guy you'd ever think would do life in church. He just doesn't look like it. I, I know some life insurance salesmen. And man, they are. Hey, what do you got here? I mean, they're in your favor. Ever met insurance salesmen? These people are pushy. Well, some of them are. Not all of them, I'm sure. Don't frown at me if you are one. But Albert began to be pretty good at his life insurance business. I'm sure it was blessing of the Lord. I'm sure it was a number of things. But it, it happened so that Albert was put in a position to attend conferences and conventions and trainings with the other men of the company. And, and they would come from all over. And eventually they'd get to know each other. And, and Albert really stuck out because he didn't do what they did. And he was always sort of shunned. But he asked, how do, I, how do I win them, Lord? What do I do? And the Lord gave him an ingenious little idea. Now, this was, you got to understand, this is probably 25 years ago. Or, no, it's more longer than that. 30 years, some years ago. He would go to these conventions, and he'd always keep a cigarette lighter in his pocket. And he says, Inve inevitably, somebody's going to stand around talking. They're going to pull out a cigarette. out and just give him a light. What do you do with a lighter, man? You're, you don't even smoke. What's your problem? And he would go on to be able to tell them that every Sunday he would light the baptismal at church and he would tell them about the good things that God has done in his life. He'd tell them what it means to be baptized and declaring a person's faith for Christ every single time. That, my friends, is an ingenious way to build a bridge. What kind of bridges are we building to introduce the reality of Jesus Christ where we work? I want to encourage you. They're there. Albert was not, I think he might still be alive. I'm sure he's retired doing something else, but he was the, I mean, you, you, come on. Have you ever met somebody who's a nice person, good person, but just uneventful? I don't know if that's the right word. Like me. Quiet, that's it, that's it. Not like me. But anyway, he, he I, I've always, when, when, I won't say his name, when the pastor told me, I've always remembered that. I thought, what an ingenious way. Because when you're lighting their cigarette, you, what do you do with a lighter? Well, let me tell you. They're not going to pull away from you. They're going to stand to you because you opened the door with kindness. You open the door with an opportunity. I think we also need to see our job as a building project. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart. As working for the Lord, not for man. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Do it as you are. The Lord Jesus Christ you're serving. Now, here's an interesting thing. When you read this, you understand that Paul is talking to people who are not going to raise. They're bond servants. You go to the, the verse before, they're bond servants. They're not going anywhere. They're slaves. You're working for the Lord. How do we feel about our jobs? Are we working for the man or are we working for the Lord when we know we're not going to get anywhere else? It's important as Christians we understand how important it is that we're working for the Lord. It's more important than what we do for a living. I think we need to be careful. Any job you hold can be transformed when you use it, view it as a blessing, a bridge, and a connector. We need to understand that we need to be people on Labor Day who, who really view labor as a joy. Amen? I, I'm going to skip a whole page here because I've read enough verses and i got three or four sleeping. So. so I want us to understand this, that when we work, view your job as a building project. You're working on people. It is so important that you ask the Holy Spirit, especially if you work in a company, Lord, who do you want me to focus on? Who do you want me to pray for? I had a gentleman 
I've always told the story of the gentleman <coughs> who got me after I got fired. He said, I knew you were going to get fired, so come work for me. We did. Three of the best years I ever had with Safeway. He eventually died from cancer, but I led him to the Lord because the Lord said, hey, you form a relationship with that man. I mean, he, he just, his name was Greg. And what an opportunity. He wore taps on his shoes. You could hear him coming from a mile away. He was about five foot five and 95. And he would clang in. I had to go to the phone company more than once and get a no phone. Long thing, he'd come in and get mad and grab his phone and just chuck it the other end of the wall. Hey, Greg, go get me a new phone. Yes, sir. Never said anything. Finally got him red phones. I don't know. He liked those. He didn't throw them too often. He'd come into my place of work in my cooler and you hear him tapping forever and smoking and just just steam out his ears and stand there and just tremble put out the cigarette and what's going on and he'd just stand there just mattered and horned step on a cigarette pray for me Took about two and a half years and he came to the Lord. You got a project at your job site? You got somebody you're looking at to pray for? I think we need to be people who look at our co workers, look at people, look at your neighbors, look at the people at school. Lord, which one do you want me to focus on and pray for? Which one, Lord, do you want me to, to just let your grace flow to? I think God wants to make it clear that we have a job, it's a blessing. We have a job, it's a bridge. And we have a job as a building project. We're going to build lives in Jesus Christ. I think it's important that we understand that it doesn't matter really that much where you work. As long as you go to that job and have that job with an attitude of, Lord, put me here and it's a blessing. Now, if you hate your job... Two things can happen. One, you can go on Google with the other 30-some million people who are looking for new jobs. Or you can say, Lord, help me change my attitude. You gave me this job. It's a blessing. Even if it's for just now. You ever heard that phrase, I was looking for a job when I was working at a job when I got this one? How many of you have ever been working at a job and somebody, hey, hey, would you like to come work for me? And it was a better pay, better job I have. God blesses those who honor him. Three men were working as brick masons in a cathedral. Each one was asked why he did what he did. The first man says, brick masons get paid really well. I do it for the dollars I earn. The second man said he was a brick mason because he had to pay off a large hospital debt. The third man said he was building a great building for the worship of God. What are we doing in our job site? Are we building relationships? That's important. That's important that we love people in life in Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastic, then I realized that it is good and proper for a man to eat and to drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun for a few days of life that God has given him. Don't reject work. Accept it. And for you that are retired, you're not done. Sister Teresa was asked why she did what she did and, and, and what she, why she did it. Why she did this work, and her answer is this, but it is his work. I think God wants to show his greatness by using my nothingness. And then went on, so you feel you have no special qualities? Mother Teresa simply replied, I don't think so. I don't claim anything of the work. It's his work that I am just a little pencil in his hand. 
That is all. He does the thinking. He does the writing. The pencil has nothing to do with it. The pencil has only allowed itself to be used. Loved one, each one of us here are a pencil in God's hand. Opportunities abound us continuously to love people to life. Let's look for opportunities. Let's look at where we live. Let's look at opportunities to build bridges on your job site. That's a blessing. And by the way, if you ever look for a job and not being able to find one, you understand that a job is a blessing. Carl, can I get an amen? <laughs> months and months. Overqualified. This too much, that too much. But he found one that God gave him. And it's a blessing. If you're retired from your career, you're never retired from the kingdom of God. Until... We do retire from the kingdom of God in the toilsome labor when you can't fog up a mirror. Until then, God's got great opportunities, great blessings for every one of us. Amen? I want to just, this is Labor Day, and I thought, okay, let's talk about the blessings of labor. I talked to some people, oh, a long time, it wasn't a couple years ago. Man, it must have been so nice in the Garden of Eden. Well, it probably was, but you still worked. And by the way, if you're buying hundreds of dollars worth of scratch-offs, don't. Unless you're rich enough. That's your business. I won't tell you what to do. I got to stop. I want to just encourage you. The Lord has a, a plan for your life. And part of that plan is working. Part of that plan is praying. Whether you're retired or not, that's not, the, that's not the thing. God's got opportunities for everyone within this room to reach somebody else for Jesus Christ. God's got opportunities out there if we'll seek him first and then allow him to show us where to put our time, our prayer, and our energy. And when, when we're thinking about leading somebody to the Lord, let that with the understanding, this can be work. You think it isn't hard to get up at certain times and pray for people? It isn't hard to stop what you're doing when God says, hey, I, I put this person on your heart. I need you to pray for them right now. And you do. It's work. Work is not a bad word. Work is a good word. I want us as a church to understand that we have such potential through Jesus Christ. Such potential. Because God has work for us to do. Amen? I want to encourage you. I don't know where you're at this morning. But if you're struggling some things, we're going to have a prayer time. Prayer team over here after service. And I would, I would invite you. I would encourage you. I would exhort you to come and, and have prayer. If you're hurting. Financially. Mentally. Physically. If you need to return to Jesus, if you've got areas of your life that you know where you aren't where you should be, then you need to come and pray and be prayed for. Amen? We're going to receive communion. And you do not have to be a member of this church to receive communion. Okay? Remember that we're partaking of the representation of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Carl?